Gate of Souls by Mike Lee Narrated by a Border Prince Dirge was a cursed world. It was a planet of bleak stone and black rock, and it didn't belong in the Hammerat system. Of that much, the Imperial Surveyors were certain. It was a rogue world, one orphan from its home star countless millennia of years in the past, and it had wandered through the darkness of space for millions of years more, before being trapped in the grip of Hammerat's free blazing suns. Where Dirge had come from, and what strange vistas it had crossed over the eons, the surveyors didn't care to know. Its surface was a wasteland of deep craters and jagged peaks, shrouded in thick, poisonous air, that howled ragged under the cosmic lash of Hammerat's suns. What mattered was that Dirge was rich, a virtual treasure trove for the ever-hungry forge worlds of the Pyrus Reach subsector. The planet's crust was thick with valuable metals, radioactives and minerals, and the cometary impacts that had shattered Dirge's surface had brought with them even more exotic elements in amounts never before catalogued. When news of the discovery reached the subsector capital, it touched off a frantic rush of prospectors and mining expeditions eager to cash in on the New World's untapped riches. Within the space of a year, almost two million prospectors, miners, murderers and thieves had come to Dirge to feast upon its riches. Little more than a year later, three quarters of them were dead. Seething electrical storms burned out equipment and raging winds tossed fully loaded ore haulers around like toys. Seismic activity collapsed tunnels or trapped gases exploded under the touch of plasma torches. Men were carved up in backroom brawls over claims too hazardous to mine. The outnumbered proctors mostly looked the other way, pocketing bribes equal to a year's salary on more settled worlds and counting the days until their transfers came through. Sometimes, prospectors would return to the crater cities from the crags of the deep tunnels, bearing artefacts of polished stone inscribed with strange inscriptions. When the rot gut was flowing, in many grimy taverns all over Dirge, men would sometimes go quiet and whisper of things they'd seen out in the storms. Strange, corroded spires and dark men here's covered in symbols that made their blood run cold. No one paid the stories any heed. Prospectors loved to tell tales. And what difference did some strange stories make when there was money to be made? And so, the crater cities grew, spreading like scabs across the deep impact wounds that comets left behind. Men died by the thousands, every day, killed by storms, earthquakes, carelessness or greed. Still more lost their minds from metal poisoning, mounting death or simply snapped from the stress of constant danger and merciless quotas from corporate masters dozens of light years away. They blinded themselves with homemade liquor or wasted away in the grip of drugs like Black Leith and Somna. Some sought comfort in the words of itinerant priests, putting their salvation in the hands of holy men who took their tithes and sent them back to their dormitories with empty prayers and benedictions. In the end, nothing made a difference, until a prospector named Hubert Law came down from the crags one day, sold off all of his possessions, and began preaching a new faith in the bars and back alleys of the crater cities. Law accepted no tithes. Instead, he offered people the secrets of Dirge, he spoke to broken-down miners, diseased prostitutes, and petty thieves, and told them of the lost princes, who still wandered the void in search of their wayward world. The lost princes possessed powers greater than men, 
greater even than the God Emperor, who offered nothing but mouldy catechisms and cruel exhortations for the men who lived and died beneath his gaze. Law told the fevered crowds that if they made an offering large enough, it would shine like a beacon across the void and lead the princes back to Dirge. And when they returned, they would reward the faithful with gifts beyond their comprehension. By the time the agents of the ecclesiarchy and the planetary governor realised the peril in their midst, it was already too late. The battered Aquila Lander had barely touched the Plastil tarmac before Alabel Santos was out of her seat and striding for the landing ramp, even without the grim badge of the inquisitorial rosette gleaming upon her breast, she cut a fearsome figure in her ornate power armour. One hand rested on the butt of her inferno pistol, and a sheathed power knife hung in a scabbard on her other hip. Get the gun servitors ready, she snapped at the portly middle-aged man struggling with his own restraints while fumbling for his respirator mask. I don't plan on being here long. Her man, Ballard, bleated something in reply, but she paid little heed, her armour's respirator system whining with strain as she headed swiftly out into the howling wind. Purple lightning flared overhead, catching the bustling airstrip in sharp relief. Tekadeps swarmed over a long line of parked vulture gunships, tending fuel lines and reloading rocket pods for another fire support mission over Baalbek City. On the other side of the Plastil tarmac sat a cluster of Valkyrie air assault craft, red tags fluttering from Hellstrike missiles loaded on their stubby wings. A platoon of armoured stormtroopers, part of the Guard Regiment's mobile reserve, huddled near their park transports, cursing the wind and waiting to be called into action. Santos spotted the permacrete bunkers of the regimental field headquarters, just a few hundred metres from the airstrip, the pale colour of the new structures standing out sharply from the dark grey terrain. The guards on duty raised their weapons at her approach, but hurriedly stepped aside when they saw what badge she wore. She cycled through the atmosphere lock, then pushed past bewildered and tired staff officers before marching stiffly up to a broad planning table set with an old-fashioned paper map of Baalbek City. Grainy aerial reconnaissance pics were spread across the table, highlighting different city districts. Studying them was a short, broad-chested officer, in the uniform of the Terrassian Dragoons, surrounded by a pair of staffers and a tall, forbidding woman, whose cold eyes glittered beneath the rim of her peaked commissar's cap. The colonel glanced up at Santos's approach, a curt order on his lips, but his exhausted face went pale at the sight of the gleaming rosette. His gaze continued upwards. The Inquisitor's head was held stiffly erect in a frame of brass, lending her stunning features the severe cast of a martyred saint. Colonel Ravin, I presume, she said without preamble. Red light flashed balefully from her augmetic eye. I am Inquisitor Alabel Santos of the Order Hereticus. What is your situation? To his credit, the colonel didn't skip a beat, as though having an Imperial Inquisitor arrive unannounced at his headquarters was all in a day's work. Two months ago, dissident elements among the mining population engineered a planet-wide revolt, overwhelming the local proctors and PDF contingents. I know why you're here, Colonel, Santos snapped. I've been reading your dispatches since you arrived on Dirge. She studied the picks scattered across the table and plucked one from the pile, sliding it over to the Colonel. 
The aerial image showed a mob of citizens surrounding a bleached pillar of bone, their gloved hands raised in supplication before the blasphemous sigil at its peak. You aren't dealing with dissidents, Santos replied coldly. They are something altogether worse. Colonel Ravin and the Commissar eyed one another. They call themselves the Cult of the Black Stone, the Commissar said. That's all we've been able to learn so far. Then I shall educate you further, Santos said, leaning across the table. This is the symbol of the word-bearers, Colonel. The Inquisitor rapped the Pict sharply with her knuckle for emphasis, causing the staff officers to jump. The ruinous powers have taken an active interest in Dirge, and I have reason to believe that one of their greatest champions is at work in Baalbek City. I have come halfway across the subsector to find out why. And to stop him, once and for all, Emperor Willing, Santos thought grimly. You have much to answer for, Erebus. Colonel Raven's pallor deepened. But that's... that's incredible, he stammered. Traitor marines, here? How do you know this? Because it is the Inquisition's business to know such things, Santos snapped, turning back to the pigs. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw the colonel stiffen. Then, with an effort, she reined in her temper. You have enough enemies without needing to make more, she reminded herself. It's all in the reports, colonel, she explained. I have been studying every status report, administratum log and ecclesiarchal dictum, filed from Dirge for the last six months. Santos picked uh, up one of the picks. It showed the planetary governor's palace in Bolbeck City. Like all city structures, it was low, broad and windowless, built to withstand the frequent cyclones that swept over the crater wall from the wastelands. The resolution of the Pict was good enough that she could recognise the impaled figure of the planetary governor, suspended on a girder among an iron forest set on the palace roof. The Inquisitor set the Pict aside and reached for another. Four months before the uprising, merchant ships were reporting strange surveyor readings in the vicinity of the system's far asteroid belt. Santos continued. The local port authority dismissed the reports as pirate activity, but curiously, there was a dramatic drop in pirate attacks in the system over the same time period. Shortly afterwards, orbital traffic control detected a number of unidentified flights into and out of Dirge's atmosphere. Again, these reports were passed off as smuggling activity. But... I have another theory. A Chaos warship entered the system and is likely still here, hiding in one of the system's asteroid fields. Santos studied an image of cultists dragging bloody corpses from a burning dormitory towards the base of one of the cult's sacrificial pillars. She set it aside with a frown of contempt. Then there are arrest reports from the local Arbites headquarters. In the days leading up to the uprising, several cult figures were arrested and, when put to the question, they described their leaders as armoured giants, the Lost Princes, according to one of the prisoners. The cultists described the greatest of these princes as a god among men, who wore the skins of his foes as testament to his power, and bore a mighty talisman of his god's favour. The chaos champion you spoke of, the commissar declared. Who is he? But Santos shook her head. I dare not speak his name. I have placed your souls in peril just telling you this much. One picked after another showed cultists at work around hab units and municipal buildings across the city, carting out truckloads of debris and hauling them away. 
After the fourth such image, she began to line them up on the map table in chronological order. If the prisoner was to be believed, there was no less than five word-bearers present on dirge, including the Chaos Lord. That's an astonishing number for such a minor world. Minor? Ravin said. Dirge supplies more than half of the industrial materials used by forge worlds across the subsector. The word bearers don't make war according to the Tactica Imperium, Santos declared. They don't think in terms of lines of supply or resource interdiction. They fight for souls, spreading terror and debasement from world to world like a cancer. Dirge, however, is both isolated and sparsely populated. From their standpoint, it's a poor target. The Inquisitor studied the line of images, and her frown deepened. Colonel, why did you order these images taken? Ravin looked over the pics and waved dismissively. We were trying to gauge the extent and composition of the enemy fortifications based on how much material they were excavating. Those work teams have been at it day and night since before we got here. Santos straightened. Excavations? The Inquisitor felt her blood run cold. These cultists aren't using floor panels and wall board to build fortifications, Colonel. They're hollowing those buildings out to dig for something. That's why the word-bearers are here, why he is here. The rebellion was just a diversion so they could search the planet without interference. Her hand was trembling slightly as she snatched up the last picked in the line. The time code in the corner indicated that the last excavation had begun almost three days ago. No new excavation since, she realised. They must think they've found what they're after. Colonel, I require the use of your mobile reserve and a flight of vultures, Santos declared in a steely voice. I'll brief the platoon leader en route. The building had formerly housed the local Tive Assessor's office, only three stories tall, square, windowless and slab-sided. The structure was built like a treasure vault, which wasn't far from the truth. A small army of servitors and stooped scribes had toiled night and day within its cold, gloomy cells, recording the profits of the mining cartels and the independent prospectors, and assessing the Emperor's due. Now, the square outside the building was piled with the guts of the Imperial Tax Collection Machine. Large, ornate cogitators stood in drunken ranks, their wooden cabinets splintered, and their brass gauges tarnishing in the corrosive air. Drifts of torn cables and mounds of flooring and wallboard were plucked and pushed by the restless wind, and a ball of glittering dust swirled endlessly in the harsh construction lamps erected by the work crews outside the building. Glass crunched like brittle bones beneath Erebus's armoured boots as he stepped through the narrow doorway. Just beyond the threshold, a tiled floor extended for less than a metre before ending in a jagged cliff of permacrete and steel. The miners of Dirge knew their trade well. Working day and night, they'd completely torn out the first two floors and the building's two sublevels. Tangles of shorn wiring and crumpled metal ducting and shreds of wallboard hung like man-made stalactites from the gutted ceiling, painted white with a layer of grit that sparkled in the harsh light of the construction lamps. All work had stopped in the pit below. More than two dozen men set aside their tools and prostrated themselves on the rocky ground at the Chaos Lord's arrival. Erebus looked out over the fruit of their labours, and was pleased. Once the sublevels had been removed, the miners had dug another three metres into the grey, ashy soil, before they'd found the first of the black stones. 
It had taken another day of careful work under difficult conditions to lift away millions of years of rock-hard incrustations that had covered the strange symbols carved into their surface. The work had gone slowly because the delicate sonic brushes would run out of power after only a few minutes in proximity to the rocks and because the workers' brains disintegrated from prolonged exposure to the symbols themselves. Even from where Erebus stood he could feel the power of the warp rising like black frost from the surface of the accursed objects. On the orders of Magus Algol, the tallest of the stones had been pulled upright again. It rose five metres into the air, casting a long, misshapen shadow across the excavation site. The surface of the object looked crude and rough-hewn, but the symbols carved into the rounded surface were sharp and precise. They climbed the stone in a kind of spiral, following the rules of a language that had died out before the birth of mankind. At the top of the stone, the symbols ended at the base of a perfect sphere, haloed by an arch of stone wrought in the shape of twining tentacles. Erebus smiled, revealing pointed teeth and the fearful demeanour of a cruel and vengeful god. The Chaos Lord was clad neck to foot in the imposing armour of a space marine, but where its ancient engravings once extolled the might of the Emperor of Man, it now preached an altogether different faith. Blasphemous runes and symbols of ruin pulsed sickly from the traitor marine's breastplate and the edges of his pauldrons and the skulls of defiled imperial priests hung from a brass chain around Erebus's neck. Psalms of vengeance and depravity were scribed in blood upon the tanned hides of fallen space marine heroes and stretched between barbed spikes across the Chaos Lord's pauldrons, and from hooks at his waist. In his right hand, Erebus held aloft a talisman of fearsome power, the Dark Crozius, symbol of his faith in the Chaos Gods. A broad ramp, wide enough for two men to walk abreast, had been built from the ground floor to the base of the excavation. Its steel supports quivered slightly as Erebus descended slowly into the pit. His black gaze was fixed on the standing stone and the orb at its summit. Erebus stepped unflinchingly into the stone's twisted shadow. The darkness that fell upon him was unnaturally cold. Sinking effortlessly through the bulk of his demonic armour, the Chaos Lord felt his shriveled insides writhe at the icy echo of the warp, and Erebus welcomed it, spreading his massive arms wide, his mind filled with visions of the seething gulf, the ocean of mad wonder that the servants of the false emperor called the Oculus Terriblis. It was the font of godhood, the birthplace of universes. Amid the roiling sea of unfettered power, Erebus beheld a swollen red orb that glittered like a drop of congealing blood. He heard the cries of multitudes, the chorus of supplication sung at the feet of his unholy master, and he longed to join his voice to the song. Lugar, his mind called into the void. The time draws near, unholy one. Soon the gate will swing wide. Erebus chuckled to himself, the sound echoing in the cavernous space and caused the cultists to tremble in fear. He turned to the assembled multitude, his eyes alighting on two figures kneeling apart from the storm-suited labourers. One was a hulking giant in red armour similar to Erebus's own, the frail elderly man hunched next to the word-bearer looked as slight as a children's puppet, all slender sticks and grimy rags, too fragile to touch. The Chaos Lord favoured his servants with another dreadful smile. 
Arise, fail Dupal, he commanded gravely. And you, Magus Algol, blessed are you in the eyes of the gods who wait. The Magus rose to his feet with an agility that belied his frail and aged appearance. His skin had the grey pallor of a corpse, his thin, wrinkled lips pulling back from gleaming steel teeth in an avaricious grin. His dark robes, once decorated with the fur mantle and chains of a magus archaeologist, now bore lines of depraved script that spoke of his allegiance to the ruinous powers. Algol's eyes glittered like black marbles in the shadows of his sunken eye sockets, bright with forbidden knowledge and reptilian cunning. Dupal, one of the Chaos Lord's chosen lieutenants, bowed deeply to his master and stepped to one side, turning so that he could keep the assembled workers in the open doorway in view at all times. One hand rested on the butt of his holstered bolt pistol, the other, clad in a fearsome, outsized gauntlet called a power fist, opened and closed in an unconscious reflex, as though the weapon hungered for a victim to crush in its grip. Magus Algol walked a careful path around the sharp edges of the stone shadow, looking up at Erebus with a calculating smile. You see, great one, it is just as the Book of the Stone described. Algol's voice was harsh and quavering, like the sharp note of a plucked wire. I told you we would find it here. Erebus regarded the towering stone greedily. Have you deciphered the runes yet, Magus? Does it tell us where the Orb of Shadows lies? In time, in time, the Magus said, raising a wrinkled hand. The runes require careful study, Great One. Their meanings, if interpreted without proper care, could be explosive. But, Algol added quickly, it does indeed speak of the orb. You will have the answer you seek. Then do not let me keep you from your work, blessed Magos, Erebus said to the man. Inform me the instant that you have deciphered the text. The Magus bowed to the Chaos Lord, and approached the stone, his hands fluttering eagerly as he began to contemplate the inscriptions. Erebus joined his lieutenant. Send word to the throne of pain, he said quietly, referring to the cruiser hiding in Dirge's outer asteroid field. We will return to Ebok as soon as Algol has uncovered the location of the orb. Then our work will well and truly begin. Dubal looked back at the looming stone, his black eyes lingering on the sphere. Once we have the orb, what then? Then we seek the Temple of Ascendancy, Erebus replied. I believe it to be on Farin, in the Elysian system. But the orb will tell us for certain. The traitor marine stiffened fixing his master with a suspicious stare. Ascendancy. You seek to follow the same path as Lorgar. Erebus returned his lieutenant's stare. Aye. No, Depaul, I am but a humble servant, he said enigmatically. Perhaps I seek to blaze a path for Lorgar to follow me. Dupal's eyes widened in shock. Before he could reply, however, the ground shook beneath a drumbeat of thunderous explosions as Imperial rockets slammed into the side of the hollowed-out building. One hand gripping a support strut just inside the Valkyrie's open hatchway, Alabel Santos leaned out into the assault craft's howling slipstream and watched the vulture gunship streak over the flat roof of the target building. 
Fires were burning from rocket strikes in the debris-choked square, and tendrils of smoke rose from craters blasted into the building's thick permacrete wall. The landing zone looked clear. The free Valkyries of the mobile reserve platoon, plus an extra support craft carrying Ballard and his gun servitors, were howling along at roof height down one of the city's narrow streets, right on the heels of the gunships. She could already feel the Valkyrie start to slow as they dropped towards the deck, preparing to flare their engines for tactical deployment. Santos swung back into the passenger compartment and addressed the platoon commander. Once we hit the ground, we're going to have to move fast, have two of your squads form a perimeter around the Valkyries, and I'll have my gun servitors provide support. You and the assault team go in with me. Once we're inside, don't hesitate. Don't think. Just kill everything that moves. The stormtrooper lieutenant nodded at Santos his face hidden behind a full-face tactical respirator that gave him a look of an automaton. His vox unit crackled. "'Where with you, Inquisitor?' he said curtly. "'The Emperor protects.' Santos drew her pistol, just as the Valkyrie plummeted like a stone and then stopped less than a metre over the rubbish-strewn square with its engine shrieking. There was a stuttering roar as the door gunner let off a burst with his heavy bolter at some distant target. Go, go, go! she shouted, leaping from the assault craft and heading for the building at a run. Behind her, the stormtrooper assault team deployed with speed and precision, hell guns covering the building's entrance. The lieutenant followed right behind Santos, a plasma pistol in one hand, and a crackling power sword in the other. The Inquisitor pulled her power knife free from its scabbard and thumbed its activation rune. She rarely carried it. The knife was an heirloom weapon, given as a gift from her mentor, Inquisitor Graslin, when she attained the rank of Inquisitor. Santos held the weapon in a white-knuckled grip as she charged into the building's narrow doorway. She was going to bury that burning blade in the Chaos Lord's eye, or die trying. Chunks of broken permacrete and twisted plasteel continued to rain down from the gutted ceiling among Erebus and the cultists as turbofans shrieked and heavy weapons fire hammered outside. The Chaos Lord looked for Magus Algal and found the corrupted scholar on his knees, coughing wetly amid falling drifts of dust. Finish your translation, Magos, Erebus thundered, then raised his accursed Crozius before the huddled cultists and spoke in a piercing voice. Rise up, warriors of the faith. The servants of the false emperor are upon us. The eyes of the gods are upon you. Go forth and win their favour. With a lusty howl, the cultists staggered to their feet and brandished the tools of their trade, heavy sonic drills, power mattocks and arc hammers. They knew from bitter experience what these tools could do to soft flesh and brittle bone. Dubel drew his bolt pistol. There was a searing crackle as he ignited his power fist disruption field. Death to the servants of the false emperor, he roared, and the cultists surged forward, racing up the ramp to the doorway, just as the first of the attackers stepped into view. An inquisitor, Erebus thought, catching sight of a woman in ornate power armour leading the charge. Her alabaster face was distorted in a snarl of almost feral rage. And she fixed him with such a black look of hate that he could not help but think they'd met somewhere before. Erebus bared his teeth in challenge and spread his arms in welcome, words of blasphemous power hissing off his tongue. There, the shock of seeing the Chaos Lord again sent a bolt of pure righteous fury through Alabel Santos. Erebus was mocking her, 
grinning like a devil, his arms open wide. I'll give you something to smile about, she thought, raising her inferno pistol. Just as she drew a bead on Erebus, another armoured shape rushed in front of the apostle, bolt pistol raised. The mass reactive round smashed into her shoulder and chest before her ears registered the flat boom of the pistol's report. The impacts spun her around, the servos in her power suit whining dangerously as they fought to compensate for the blows. Footsteps thundered up the ramp towards Santos as a dozen cultists charged forwards, weapons ready. The lieutenant appeared beside the Inquisitor, levelling his pistol and firing two quick shots into the oncoming mob. Bolts of superheated plasma blew the lead cultists apart. Flamer to the front, the platoon leader ordered over his vox. Armoured stormtroopers fanned out on the narrow lip of the permacrete to either side of the doorway, firing red bolts of las fire into the charging cultists. Then a soldier stepped to the top of the ramp and fired a hissing stream of burning Prometheum point-blank at the charging miners. The cultists shrieked and fell back from the tongue of searing flame, setting the ramp alight with their tumbling, thrashing bodies. Two stormtroopers to Santos's right were blown off their feet by bolt-pistol rounds, their carapace armour no match for the traitor marine's deadly fire. The Inquisitor dropped to one knee, trying to peer through the thickening black smoke and strobing lasfire for another glimpse of the Chaos Lord. She couldn't see him, but she could hear him, his deep, sonorous voice chanting terrible words that sent a shiver down her artificial spine. The Chaos Lord's voice rose to a terrifying crescendo, and for a moment it felt as though the very air in the room was receding, drawing back from the battle as if in horror. The screams of the burning cultists went silent all at once. Then Santos felt the fabric of reality come unravelled. She heard a chorus of screeching howls and tasted hot brass on her tongue. But before she could draw breath to shout a warning, the demons were upon them, charging straight through the fire. They had faces like skinned wolves, and their powerful, muscled bodies gleamed with freshly spilled blood. Their eyes, their fangs, and their twisted horns were pure brass, bright from the forge, as well as the razor edges of their two-handed axes. Upon their sloped brows were carved the mark of the blood god. And they had come for a bounty of skulls to lay at the foot of his throne. Men screamed. The stormtrooper carrying the flamer fell to one knee and toppled onto Santos, splashing the Inquisitor with blood. Roaring an oath to the Divine Emperor, she pushed the corpse aside, just as the blood-spattered figure loomed above her. She didn't feel the blow. There was a hot wind against her face, and then there was a strange sensation of warm blood soaking through the body glove around her shoulder. Her left arm locked in place, and Santos felt the sting of needles as the suit's Medicare unit attempted to keep her from lapsing into shock. All she could think was, Thank the Emperor, it missed my head. Then she put her pistol against the demon's midsection and pulled the trigger. A bolt of pure cyan, powerful enough to pierce the armour of a land raider, tore the demon apart and then detonated like a thunderclap against the ceiling. The blood letter dissolved in tatters of stinking, oily smoke. Santos fell backwards, landing against the marble verge, as though in slow motion she could see another demon rushing at her, axe raised to strike. There were screams and the clash of steel somewhere nearby, and then, out of the corner of her eye, she saw the smoke shift and reveal the red-armoured form of the Dark Prophet standing before a monolith of twisted stone. Death approached on cloven feet. Santos could feel her strength fading, and between one heartbeat and the next, she made her choice. 
Taking her eyes from the demon, she steadied her pistol against the marble tiles. With a tick of her cheek, she activated her augmentic eye's laser sight. The needle-thin beam glittered in the smoke, tracing a merciless line across the open space and painting a bloody dot on the Chaos Lord's forehead. This is for Crendon Hive, she whispered and pulled the trigger. The blood letter howled above her and then staggered as a bolt of plasma smashed into its head. The demon staggered, then the blade of a power sword sank into its chest. The lieutenant leapt over Santos's body as the demon's form dissolved. Get the Inquisitor to safety, he ordered, taking aim on another demon and shooting it in the face. The Emperor protects, he bellowed, taking another step down the burning ramp. Santos felt hands grab the collar of her armour. Darkness crowded on the edge of her vision. The thunderclap of her shot rang through the open space, and she tried to catch a glimpse of Erebus again, but all she could see was the lieutenant advancing coolly into the face of the onrushing demons and firing shot after shot from his plasma pistol. The weapon's discharge vents were glowing white hot, and his armoured gauntlet was melting from the heat. The Emperor protects, she heard him say as another demon loomed before him. The lieutenant fired his pistol again, and this time the overheated power core exploded, consuming him and his foe in a ball of incandescent light. Santos felt herself dragged across the stone floor, and passed out in a fiery wave of pain. Erebus saw the bright flare of the Inferno pistol, and for the briefest instant he feared that the dark gods had deserted him. His vision deserted him in a blaze of cyan, and a clap of terrible thunder dashed him to his knees. By the time he regained his senses, the battle was over. The ramp was gone. Indeed, the entire front of the building had collapsed, sealing the doorway with tons of broken permacrete. A bare handful of flickering work lights still cast a fitful glow over the site. For a moment, Erebus started to laugh. He raised his crozius and offered his thanks to the ruinous powers for their dark gifts. Nothing in this universe would keep him from reaching the damnation gate. Still laughing, the Chaos Lord turned to look for Magus Algol and saw that the dark gods had been fickle with their blessings. The Inquisitor's bolt had missed Erebus and struck the monolith instead. Its dark surface had exploded, erasing the engravings in a storm of razor-edged shrapnel. Algol lay on his back at the foot of the ancient stone, his frail body shredded and a look of surprise etched on his bony face. Erebus knelt by the body of the dead Magus. Nearby he heard a shifting of fallen rock, and glanced over to see Dupel, picking himself up from the rubble. The traitor marine saw what had happened to Algol, and hissed a vicious curse. We'll go back to Abok, empty-handed now, the traitor marine spat. The Chaos Lord studied Algol's shocked face. I think not, he said, taking the Magus's head in his left hand. The man's thin neck snapped with an expert twist of his wrist. Vertebrae popped in dry succession. And then Oedipus held Algol's head up to the flickering light. The monolith is gone, but the eyes that beheld it still remain, Oedipus said. The eyes are the gateway to the soul, Dubel. And gates, once opened... We'll give up everything they contain. Erebus looked into Algol's eyes and laughed, seeing his future. Thanks for watching, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this. I'm working on a lot of different stuff at the moment. I'm hoping to uh, bring you videos as often as possible. Thank you to everybody supporting the channel recently. I've had a, an uptick in people supporting. And uh, I want to say just I appreciate it massively. I'm, I've got a bit of a difficult time at the second. I've, I know everybody has situation shit across the board. Um, I'm also quitting smoking. And as of recording this, I have, I have uh, not had a cigarette in... What time is it?
I've got 45 hours. I haven't had a cigarette in. No. No, no, it's less than that. 44. <laughs> 40, I've got four hours to go. And then I haven't had a cigarette in two days, which is the first time that's happened to me in uh, t- no, seven years. That'll be the first time, I think, since that's happened. Um, so I'm a little bit on edge at the second, as you can possibly imagine, if you've ever been a smoker. And if you're not, trust me, it's the worst possible thing in the world. It's crap. But it's my own fault. Um, but what I mean by that is I may possibly be a bit um, out of sorts when I'm recording. I may not be able to record for one or two days because I'm probably going to end up coughing my guts up um, after a couple of days of not smoking, as that's what happens, basically. So, yeah, um, but I will be doing as much stuff as I can. Even if I can't record and my voice is a bit shot for a few days, I will, uh, I'll will i be writing a lot of scripts ready to come back with more stuff um, and a lot of exciting stuff to come. I've got big plans for stuff. It's just, at the second, I'm a, I'm a bit out of sorts, you know? So I've tried to record this, and hopefully it doesn't sound too off. Hopefully it sounds fine, I hope. And But yeah, um, your names are all here. If your name isn't on here, it will definitely be on the next one. It just depends on when I update the, the, the video and when I make the video and when you support the channel and stuff. But if you do want to support, you can use uh, Patreon or subscribe. Start by following the links below, or you can become a YouTube channel member, which is fantastic as well. And you get all the... You get all, like, emotes and stuff like this if you do it on YouTube. All right, lads, I'm going to go because um, I really want a fag, and I can't have a fag, so I've got to go and distract myself by doing work. And, yeah, ah, it's the worst thing ever. <laughs> I'm going to go. Bye-bye. Stay well. Cheers. Bye.